that they built, but they donated it to ADOT in uh, 2001 or two. But they did have, so this is the uh, exaggerated view of this trailer here. So they did have two microphones, which used to record the noise. Okay. But then they found that there, there could be some flaws with, with this setup, because this is, this is an external setup, away from the vehicle by itself. So they would want it, they wanted to measure the noise that is emanating from the tires of the vehicle by itself. So they came up with this methodology, which is which is now an ASTM standard. It's called the onboard sound intensity. So they, they have housed the microphones very close to the tire. So they, they actually eliminate also the other extraneous noise. And they do have this uh, uh, cover that, that takes care of that. So this uh, table that you see here is coming from this NCAT trailer, sound intensity, measured on four different mixtures, four different pavement sections. One of them is the asphalt rubber friction course that you saw in the, in the video. Okay, that was about between 96 and 97 EVA. All the way to 110, almost, with the Portland cement concrete. In, in the video you saw it was about 112 or 113. So on, on an average, uh, this was about, uh, these values came from about 80 sections. Uh, from Arizona and California. Okay. It, was a, it was a joint project between ADOT and Caltrans. So it's almost uh, 10 decibels difference between the quietest, which is asphalt rubber friction cone, versus the noisiest, which is the quarter zone concrete. Okay, that was the field uh, lab testing, uh, field testing, the field measurement techniques. But that there was, uh, they wanted to also characterize how it how we can characterize noise in lab. So that was the other objective. This is the research part. Uh, Professor Naithalath, who is here right now at ASU, Narayana Naithalath, he was also instrumental in, in devising this setup at Purdue in 2000 and, uh, I think it was 2002 to 4. But the, the, the limitation, limitation of this setup is that they run the tire around the drum. You can you can actually have different sections around the drum. Okay, but this runs only at about 25 miles per hour. But as you, as I told you before, the tire pavement interaction noise is more pronounced at speeds higher than 25 miles per hour. So this is this still can characterize, but it, it does have some limitations to it. But then there is one more other uh, methodology that's prevalent around the world: impedance cube. <coughs> So you can house a sample here, a material, and then uh, you can impinge an acoustic wave through the impedance tube, which is a cylindrical tube by itself. So you can have two microphones or just one, and then you can measure the noise emanating. So you can amplify that, and then you can weight it, and then you get the value of the distance. So you can, you can prepare your own samples in the lab, basically, the cylindrical samples between 15 and uh, you know, 100 centimeters thickness. So you can you house the sample here and then you impinge a uh, wave, acoustic wave and the microphones measure it. Something very similar to the one that you saw in the OBSI where you have two microphones here at the time. So it's something very similar. You have two microphones. This is very close to what we observe in the field. But the limitation of that method is that you need to have a very high skill and it's a very expensive equipment. So we wanted to see if we can develop a methodology in the lab at ASU to characterize noise. A simpler tool that can actually account for noise coming from the materials. And we did have a lot of data here. As for rubber mixtures, conventional dense graded, Portland cement concrete, gap graded, and then conventional and asphalt rubber, so modified mixtures, polymer mixtures, all of them. So since we had so much of data, we thought we could do something with, with, by, uh, in the lab to, to actually devise a new tool that can characterize noise in the lab. Uh, before we go into that subject, there are a lot of noise studies, as I told you, globally that are, that are going on right now. One of the latest ones is the Persuade. Uh, and I was in Sweden working on this project where uh, the, we were trying to develop a material that's really or 15 decibels lower than a conventional dense grade mix. 15 decibels. 
So five decibels less than an asphalt rubber friction course that you see in Arizona. And that material uh, has no asphalt in it. It's just rubber plus a different binder. Uh, so it was, it was a, it is still under development. I, we don't know what, what will happen. We haven't placed a test section as yet. And we, we anticipate that it will be done this year and we will, we will actually measure field noise. But we could characterize those materials for their durability aspect, meaning mechanical properties. And we found that that material is very close to an asphalt rubber material in terms of strength. But it still needs a different binder characteristic. And those things we will not uh, discuss today. But So there are a lot of projects that have undergone in the European Union uh, all the way from 1990, which uh, the silence started in 1990. Persuade is still ongoing. It will go on until 2016. Now the picture that you see is uh, the, the development of different materials as part of these projects. So they develop two layer porous asphalt. Still porosity plays a major role as I told you before. And here you see a slide where they have achieved at least about nine decibels change with a double layer porous asphalt. So they have two different layers of porous material, meaning two different asphalt rubber mixtures. Although they didn't have rubber in it, but it's still a porous material. And here is uh, the, the plot of noise with respect to age. So it's about seven years, and they see that it diminishes about five decibels, so almost half a decibel per year. And this was uh, also verified from Arizona test sections. Okay. That was an independent study, anyway. And USA tire pavement noise studies, yes. The, Arizona Quiet Payment Program that, that ran for about 10 years, all the way from 1999 to 2009. We still have a lot of data there. And then California Tri Department of Transportation, Florida, Ohio DOT, all the There are noise models that can characterize these noise characteristics. Okay. Uh, one of them is Hong Kong based noise model, and this one, FHW ATM, which is still under development, a lot of versions of it. Uh, so we will see what it is actually in the next slide. Okay, so here it is. So what does this Federal Highway Administration traffic noise model do? The inputs are very simple. You can have automobile, the, the, the number of automobiles that, that, that flies <coughs> on, a, on a given section. It can also house the heavy trucks, because they want to see how trucks can change the traffic noise pattern. And then there is roadway input. At this time, currently, we don't have the different pavement sections that you can input. For example, you cannot say input Portland cement concrete or asphalt cement concrete. It just says average. So they do have roadway, meaning soil, and then a base, which just has uh, old concrete. And then there is asphalt concrete, there are port Portland cement concrete. So they consider all of these to be as just pavement sections. Because this is a traffic noise model, it accounts for the, the noise coming also from the traffic, not just the pavement materials. Okay, so there is actually no pavement noise model that is developed. It's a traffic noise model. So one of the inputs is roadway, but it, at this time it's, it just says average. So there is a need to input different pavement types in the model. Okay, so that, that, that's where we are going. That's the reason that we are taking right now. But then there is one thing that we can really utilize, and that's this. It says ground zone module, one of the modules in the, in the noise model, is that it says pavement section. But then you can input something called flow resistivity value of a material. Okay, so that, that was the other problem. Uh, there is no flow resistivity value for any of the materials that, is, that has come out uh, or disseminated from the FHWA. So we thought we could work on this, and we are still working on it. Then, the, so we can actually customize. That's the advantage of this module here. So we will see how how we could vary those in the next few slides. So, what noise research that we have done at ASU? So the first part will actually be the viscoelastic properties. That's nothing to do with FHW ATNM, but it's something that's really uh, a unique thing that we did here because, as I told you, we have a lot of data with respect to asphalt rubber mixtures, uh, conventional dense graded, polymer modified, 
uh, rubber, with rubber, without rubber, all those materials. So we thought maybe there is something, a parameter that can really distinguish between different materials, payment noise characteristics. Okay. Any questions so far? Oh, it's not in class, but uh, just asking. Okay. So the first part, as I told you, will be viscoelastic properties. Basically, asphalt mixtures, some of you know here already, and asphalt mixtures are viscoelastic materials, meaning they, they have two different components. One of them is the viscous, and then the elastic. If you actually take Portland cement concrete, it is purely elastic. There's no viscous component associated with it. But we had about 300 mixtures, more than 300, which also included modified mixtures, which is an example will be in asphalt rubber. Okay, we had about 25 asphalt rubber mixtures that, that were sent from ADOT for characterization. So we could utilize that. So ASU has a larger database of asphalt <laughs> mixtures around the world, I would say, 300 plus. I don't think any of the other universities or institutes have this. Okay. So one of the tests that was developed as part of NCHRP project or the design guide was the EAST or dynamic modulus test. And this is being used as a simple performance test, although this is not really a simple test. Okay, so you load this sample, you prepare a sample which is sailed with basically. Okay, it's 100 millimeter in diameter, 4 inches, and 6 inches height, 150 millimeter. And then uh, you load the sample at different frequencies which translates into traffic speeds. Okay, so you run it at six different frequencies, meaning six different uh, traffic speeds, all the way from static loading until about 120 miles per hour speed. Okay, and then you can run it at five different temperatures. Since as for mixtures are viscoelastic in nature, you'll have to test it at different temperatures. Unlike the concrete mixtures, which are purely elastic, so they don't have an influence of temperature. So we run it at five different temperatures, all the way from 14 Fahrenheit, minus 10 Celsius, to about 130 Fahrenheit, which is almost 55 Celsius. But you should note that the pavement temperatures can go up, up until 70 Celsius in real field scenario. But if you test this sample at 70 Celsius, it will start to disintegrate. You cannot test the sample. So 54 by itself is really tough, but we have managed it uh, by, by confining it with a membrane. Okay. So what the, 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 the concept of the test is that you run it, you run a sinusoidal loading, so you run a, you input a stress value, it's a constant stress test. But you, you limit it with a strain, meaning you don't damage the sample, so it's a non-destructive test. So you can use the same sample at different frequencies and different temperatures. So you are within the linear viscoelastic range, meaning you don't damage the sample. So we have, as I told you, over 300, we had 300 mixtures, and the mixtures have, have been added have, have been uh, added to the database every every year and every. Uh, we still we the other thing is we also have mixtures coming from California. We have mixtures coming from Sweden. We have mixtures coming from different states, from from the uh, around the country also. So that also is there in the database. Okay. And it's, it's an ASHTO uh, temporary protocol as of now. It was basically an ASTM standard before, but then there were some modifications that were done during the MEPDG program. Uh, it's still not a full-fledged protocol, but it is anticipated that it will be done. So, so we came up with uh, another field over here, but before that we need to understand what, is, what are the outputs of this test. So the two outputs of this experiment is that we get a stiffness value, which is the strength by itself, and then the viscoelastic property of the phase angle. And phase angle is really related to both vis viscous part and the elastic part. That, that's what you see here. So phase angle is a ratio of the viscous part to the elastic. And both of them are the inherent characteristics of the material. So we came up with a, with a different figure that you saw before, a sinusoidal figure. And phase angle 
is one of the outcomes of the experiment. So if, if the value